Just last year, the EU launched the EU strategy for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific, marking a significant point as Europe strives to become more active in the region. The Indo-Pacific, a region of unrivaled potential and unprecedented opportunity, also presents an existential threat to the EU as we know it today. How can the EU compete in, in a region dominated by China and leaner, meaner and keener countries? Our guest today is a diplomat on the front lines of the EU-Asia relationship. He is the Managing Director of Asia Pacific for the European External Action Service, essentially the Foreign Ministry of the EU. We're going to ask him questions and have him answer those questions about the future of infrastructure, investment and influence in Asia. So please give a huge round of applause for Managing Director Gunnar Vigan. Mr. Vegan, it's, it's a pleasure to have you here. Now, first of all, before we start, a quick question for our audience. Raise your hand if you think you know how many countries there are in the Indo-Pacific. There's only one. Okay. How many? No. No. So, so not so, ma not so many. No. Mr. Vegan, perhaps you could introduce the Indo-Pacific to us, as you see we don't know that much about it. I'm afraid I create this. I think let's just wait one moment. There we go. That's better. Can you hear me? I seem to be under some tension. Apparently. It's loudly confusing. I, I will try to give an answer to the question which was not answered. Uh, no, nobody can give you a precise answer because it depends on the definition of what is Indo-Pacific. Uh, I can tell you that I'm in charge of relations Union with 41 countries from, Afga from Afghanistan to the Pacific Islands. We're sorry about this. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Tim. It's, it's gonna hold the bottom, I think. No, it's gonna, it's gonna work. Try again. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, there we go. Wonderful. Hey. So I'm in charge of relations of the European Union with 41 countries from Afghanistan to the Pacific Islands, from Mongolia to New Zealand. The biggest, the smallest, the richest, the poorest. We have everything there. But that is not the definition of Indo-Pacific because mm -hmm. uh, for uh, us, the Indo-Pacific starts, of course, also at the eastern shores of Africa and uh, also at the Gulf. So it depends how many of the Gulf, how many of Africa you want to count into this. And the Indo-Pacific strategy uh, tries in, indeed to uh, add to the many different uh, strategic approaches we have vis-a-vis -vis China, vis-a-vis -vis Japan, vis-a-vis -vis India, vis-a-vis -vis ASEAN. This maritime dimension, this huge spatial dimension where we want to make sure that EU interests are Preserve that the international law, the UN Charter, is followed, that security and safety is ensured, and that we have a free and open Indo-Pacific space. Right. So what does being the managing director of such a large group of countries mean, especially when you yourself speak of different strategies that safeguard EU interests? How is it managing all these different things at the same time? The European External Action Service, as you said, is yeah. the Foreign Office of the European Union. Uh, our political boss is High Representative Vice President Josep Borrell. We serve both the Council, our member states, as well as the European Commission. Inter alia with a network of uh, European Union delegations which function like embassies in the areas of competence of the European Union. In my area we have 27 of them. That means I have 27 ambassadors or heads of offices like in Hong Kong or in Taiwan. Yeah. And we are formulating the common policies of the EU vis-a-vis -vis all of these countries. Right. So you're not, obviously, not the only European diplomat in Asia. Should we see you as 
as a managing director, as a manager there, or as a coordinator, or as something else entirely? Are you a supervisory presence? In a similar uh, podcast uh, earlier this year, I was called uh, an architect and a bricklayer. Uh, I think uh, there's something of both. Okay. Uh, and as a manager, you need to be able to lead, to motivate, mm -hmm. to be creative, to give ideas, but you also need to be able to keep together, right. to make sure that uh, the team can work in a good way. And uh, that goes from career development reviews yeah. to uh, uh, management of vacancies and so on. So, yes, as a managing director, you are in the front line of getting things done. Mm -hmm. uh, you are a catalyzer, a mobilizer. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm glad that I have 27 ambassadors who are representing us abroad. But many of the negotiations we have to do from headquarters. And as, a, as an architect or and a builder, should we find you in Brussels or in Bangkok? Some... Uh, as an architect and a builder, you find me in Brussels because um, we have to, for example, we developed in 2019 the new EU-China strategy, which was one of great realism uh, and of great clarity when we defined that China is a partner for cooperation and negotiation. China is a competitor in many key technologies, and we have to take up more determined this in a more determined way this competition. And China is also a systemic rival because it has a very different system, and this uh, entails that there are many issues where we are fundamentally uh, of different views. Um, this you can do only when you work in headquarters. Right. And when you develop a new Indo-Pacific strategy, like we did last, um, year, or when you develop our connectivity strategy, where we started with the connectivity strategy for Asia in 2018, and then last year this was extended under the impulse of President von der Leyen to become a global gateway strategy. Uh, that means these kind of uh, approaches of new policy strategies you do uh, in headquarters because you need to have the Commission with all its assets, its political and legal and financial means, but you need also the approval of council and ultimately of parliament to advance on the basis of this. Right. We wanted to look into the global gateway, which you yourself just mentioned. Uh, you're, as managing director, you're overseeing the part of the 300 billion fund of global gateways that is implemented in Asia. Why is Europe investing billions of its own taxpayer money to fund infrastructure in East Asia? Well, let me first clarify the um, figure, the ballpark figure of 300 billion over the next seven years is not taxpayers' money. Part of it is, and that part comes from the development assistance which would be provided and which would help to build global gateways which are sustainable and which are built on international standards. And is that development assistance, is that the 60 billion euros from 2018? Uh, the, no, okay. uh, it's linked to the new financial framework which has started uh, last year. Okay. Um, we have um, a, uh, this, this, this figure was put forward by the president, including the mobilization effect, which we are trying to have uh, by A, mobilizing also overseas development assistance of our member states, Team Europe approach, not just EU institutions, but together with our member states, together we make more of an impact. Secondly, by mobilizing the financial institutions, uh, in particular the European Investment Bank, <coughs> largest bank in the world, not the World Bank, European Investment Bank, largest bank, plus um, the private and the national uh, uh, banks, which exist also about as public banks. So the multiplier effect is key. With overseas development assistance, we can uh, accompany uh, connectivity, we can accompany work in energy, in a green transition, in digital development, regulatory environment, uh, expertise, but the uh, investments need to be mobilized through those who invest. We do not invest as such. And that is a challenge for the Western democracies mm -hmm. in this competition you referred to earlier with China. China can say, 
we send our state uh, export import bank or we send our state development bank they should invest in this bridge yeah. or that port we cannot say this to any company now you do this or that it must be an investment which makes mm -hmm. sense which is sustainable which can be financed by the country where this investment would be done okay um, so what are the actual priority areas and goals then of the global gateways well the clear top priority areas is to to make investments to uh, help green economies okay. uh, green transition um, so for example if we invest in transport it should be in uh, transport which is um, operating in sustainable ways mm -hmm. uh, if we operate on energy it's not to create new nuclear power stations or new coal power stations but to help develop the renewable energy okay. sector uh, in particular the greening therefore and in particular the digital infrastructure All right. which includes also some secure data connections you are a digitalized generation you're always on your smartphones or on your iPads or on your computers you are used to deal with all kind of people around the world but you would like to have your data transmitted in a secure way so before global gateways they have so to, sorry yeah. just to finish this yeah. we have now mobilized finance for a new secure data cable between Europe and Latin America okay. It will soon be done with Africa, mm -hmm. and we hope to soon extend this further into and, Asia. And what are some of the other projects that you're funding in ASEM in particular? Uh, we are uh, we are identifying projects. Identifying, I not directly. I don't funding want to go. Right. No, identifying okay. means we are preparing for project decisions. Okay. I would suggest that um, further work on the um, interconnections within ASEAN. Uh, making railways, highways, uh, uh, connections much more um, uh, effective and sustainable uh, and also uh, developing uh, the digital connections between partners in ASEAN is a uh, top priority. And we are looking at several projects. Yeah. So before Global Gateways, there have been numerous EU projects in the Indo-Pacific and one of them was uh, in 2018 a 60 billion euro fund to link the EU with East Asia. How consistent is the EU's approach if we see new strategies popping up every so often? The 60 billion you are referring to from 2018 is not um, uh, something which is uh, done and over. Mm -hmm. This was an aspiration at that time and we are still uh, trying to implement this properly. Uh, we are not operating like a planned economy with a central committee and with one party. Uh, we have uh, 27 member states, each member state many parties, and uh, sometimes changing governments. Uh, and we decide on the basis of uh, midterm uh, strategies in terms of development assistance, which are done together with, together with uh, the entire strategies with each of the recipient right. countries. It takes time. So so you were talking about... And there is no contradiction between different um, approaches. There is just a development of this approach. And I want to emphasize once again, from tr traditional development assistance focused on poverty alleviation, we are moving towards support on green transition and on digital development. And we are not... Um, and, and we certainly would like to make sure that the uh, projects which we support are also in the EU's own interest. Right. But so what are the, some of the challenges here that you're facing as you, you say that you're trying to implement these, these projects? Well, the challenge is the multitude of actors okay. between European Union as such and 27 member states, of which some are more active than others in, uh, in a region which is perceived to be as far as Asia Pacific. Of course, the Balkans, Eastern Partnership, North Africa, uh, all much closer right. and we have significant more funds available I want mm -hmm. to be clear about this for Africa and for our neighborhood in particular for those neighbors who will become members of the European Union uh, Asia Pacific Latin America far more yeah, away. 
But then let's keep in mind that 30% of our trade passes through the South China Sea and the Indian Ocean. The high degree of global interconnectedness. We cannot look at this region through an angle of development assistance. Okay. Far from it. We are key partners. Number one investor, number one trade partner for many of the countries in the region and first and foremost for India and for China. Right. So kind of talking about um, opening up this region in a way, uh, you are working on several bilateral trade agreements and a few years ago quite a famous one was signed with Vietnam for a free trade agreement. Um, Vietnam is right now ranked 134th uh, on the Human uh, Rights Index. So how does the EU reconcile you know, the values of human rights when they're signing and uh, agreeing with free, free trade negotiations and making investments in the region? We are pursuing the interests of the EU in mm -hmm. ensuring uh, the best possible diversification of sourcing for goods and for services. Uh, we are talking about the diversification of risks. We are talking about the fragility of global value chains. This discussion started with the defense-related products. It continued in the COVID context with regard to health-related products. It has now reached many other products yeah. as well. This we can only do if we are securing not from one or two countries, yeah. but from a variety of them. Vietnam has done an incredible development over the last years in terms of uh, developing a highly varied industrial base. Mm -hmm. And European investors are by far the yeah. most important investors in Vietnam. Um, we have, by the way, also finalized an FTA with Singapore. So this is part of the diversification strategy. If we would only have free trade agreements with countries which have the same set of values, Mm -hmm. and are the same democratic systems as the EU, there would be very few countries, to be absolutely clear about this. We do negotiate with New Zealand, and I hope that we conclude One as possible this year. We do negotiate with the country you know best, with Australia, mm -hmm. and we should also finalize soon. We do negotiate with Indonesia, which yeah. is a democracy, and next month we start restart after a 13-year pause FTA negotiations with India, the largest democracy of the world, uh, together with an investment protection agreement and a GI agreement, if you know what GI is. Um, it's not an American soldier. I was going to say. It's geographical indications. Uh, intellectual property protection. Okay, fantastic. But, but we cannot, the trade policy of the EU is not that it can only negotiate with other partners who have the same system as we have, but we have essential elements and they are linked to human rights and they are linked to weapons of mass destruction. But it does seem that a lot of these essential elements, especially when we look at the uh, free trade agreement with Vietnam, were only implemented two years after the actual initial free trade agreement was signed. So isn't this a little too little too late? Right. No. Okay. Because signature is one thing, ratification is another thing, and entering into force is a third thing. And so these um, steps, uh, notably linked to the um, uh, ratification of key instruments under the International Labour Organization, in ILO conventions, uh, but also the establishment of um, civil society bodies, which would look both after the environmental part of the agreement, but also after the uh, labour and human rights related part of the agreement, have been created recently. But I don't want to hide from you, we are not uh, uncritical vis-a-vis -vis the yeah. situation when it comes to human rights defenders, uh, to their lawyers, to environmental activists, to labor activists in Vietnam. I just was in Hanoi uh, four weeks ago and uh, all of these issues were raised in clarity. My first meeting was with the Minister of Public Security. Right. And, and when you brought it up with the Minister of Public Security, did any effective developments come out of that meeting? Yes. And, and what were those effective developments? Can you these share? are the kind of things you cannot discuss about okay. in such an event. But I can tell you that uh, they take seriously the need to step up the efforts in this uh, domain. Mm -hmm. And um, we should, however, have no illusions about the 
type of system which exists in Vietnam, which is not dissimilar yeah. to the ones existing in Laos or in uh, China. You spoke of pursuing EU interests in the region. Are we to understand those in the context of the free trade agreements more so towards facilitating regional development or the opening of new markets for European multinationals? I do not accept the second part of the question. I have been a press spokesman for Commissioner Chris Patton. Yeah. Some of you may have studied Chinese history or Hong Kong. He played a key role as the last British governor uh, before the British Empire definitely closed the doors. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he uh, told me that um, you don't have to answer to, any, uh, to every question. Um, but I would just like to say that if we open markets, it is not that we open markets just for European multinationals. Europe has the, uh, I would say, the privilege or the, the quality that many of our member states, including my own, which is a neighboring country of the Netherlands, have a very strong SME sector. And we have many smaller and medium-sized entrepreneurs who do go into countries mm -hmm. like Vietnam or like China. It is not just for the BMWs uh, and the Volkswagen of this world that these markets are opened. Many of the products which Europe produces, not just in luxury goods, but also in industrial goods, in machinery, uh, in technology, high technology, are highly appreciated for their quality and their reliability around the world. So we open the markets for preserving employment in Europe, for getting new markets for our products, but also for obtaining products from these countries at uh, good prices for consumers in Europe. Now you could say, what is this civilization all about? It is terrible. It puts so much social pressure on our economies. We, your generation may be faced with something new, which is just being discussed at the World Economic Forum in Davos, which is called deglobalization. You have grown up in a globalized world. Information instantly, access to any country in the world, studying, living abroad at any time, discovering new countries. You, you, you then lived something very different through COVID and you may live through a deglobalization phase. But I can only say the policy of the European Union is not to close markets, but is to open markets and to diversify and to reduce risks of uh, exclusive dependencies. All right, um, so let's switch tacks a little bit here. Um, and you mentioned the term strategic rivalry. Uh, in the Indo-Pacific, EU is obviously not the only one ramping up uh, investments and free trade agreements. Um, China invests close to a trillion euros per year globally in the Belt and Road Initiative. So would the EU be investing in the region as much as it is if it weren't for China? First, you used a term which is not our term. Okay. You used the term strategic rivalry uh, with the with People's Republic of China. We use the term systemic rivalry. The term strategic rivalry is used in the United States. All right. uh, we do not believe that one has to look at empires which rise and fall again. Mm -hmm. We have too many of those among the Europeans. <laughs> we can live with that. Right. Uh, we have no problem that China rises. And in fact, the Biden administration doesn't have a problem either. Mm -hmm. They say it's not about the rise of China, it is about whether China uh, is uh, living up to the law, living up to the rules of the international system or not. Mm -hmm. So um, the strategic rivalry, I do not accept as a parameter, but okay. competition, fine. And if you talk to Sri Lankese politicians, mm -hmm and you ask them, are you happy about the Chinese-built deep-sea port Hambantota in the yeah. north uh, west of Sri Lanka, they will say it's a wonderful port except nobody uses it. And it has created a huge debt 
If you talk to the Pakistanis and ask them, are you really happy about the uh, China-Pakistan um, economic corridor? And you see all the highways and you see the power stations and then you don't see very much else. Created huge debt for Pakistan. They can't serve it as much as Sri Lanka has just defaulted. I hope it won't happen to Pakistan. Mm -hmm. So the sustainability of the Chinese approach is highly in question. Same thing with regard to several African countries. Our approach is different, that you check carefully the sustainability in environmental terms, but also the financial feasibility, that there are not projects created which are good for status, but which are good for a lasting development of the economy that projects are built with local workers mm -hmm. and with local engineers and not just with hundreds of people who come from abroad. Just name a few differences, but the key difference is that there is not an unsustainable level of debt incurred, right. which creates then political dependencies. But, so that's the difference, but the kind of motivation behind it, right? In recent years, the EU has ramped up investments in the region. Uh, but it seems to have followed the ramping up of China's investments in the region. So do you think EU now is investing more because China was investing? Uh, coming from a commercial city, there is nothing better for business than competition. Okay. All right. That, that's an answer. Looking, looking deeper, perhaps, into the systemic rivalry you yourself mentioned, just yesterday you met with the Chinese special envoy to Europe. How does this systemic rivalry play in one-on-one -on -one negotiations? Uh, he was, he's on a tour through Europe and uh, tries to ensure that we would not part into different blocks. The impact of the war of Russia against Ukraine, and I would like to recommend to all of you to read the 4 February joint statement between Russia and Ukraine carefully whether you study law or politics, whether you study economy or security, no, security studies you can't study here, I think. Um, psychology, yes, that's very good to read that one because it indicates a very high level of convergence between President Xi Jinping and President Vladimir Putin, 11 pages long. How they see the world, what is wrong about the world, and how international law is not even mentioned therein, how the Russian side buys into the Chinese interpretation of what happens in the Pacific and the Chinese side into the Russian uh, view of the European security. So we have been very clear at the China-EU summit in April, but also since then in clarifying to the Chinese side if you would now go into a strategic permanent alliance with the Russian Federation if whereas you would um, circumvent the sanctions which US, Europe and several other partners have imposed on the aggressor. If there would be weapons deliveries, then it would have a significant impact on the quality of EU-China relations, which is a relationship of high quality we are mutually economic interdependence, and uh, we are the largest trading partner for each other. Should not overlook that. So we have an interest, Chinese and Europeans have a common interest that this world continues to function as one world with one set of rules as opposed to some people have different rules than others. Some have more rights than others. Whether we succeed in trying to convince the Chinese side, that I cannot yet foresee. Okay. okay. Um, and I'm from Australia, and uh, just this week, our newly elected Prime Minister flew to meet with the Quad, um, which is the United States, Australia, India, and Japan. Um, do you see the Quad as also a systemic rival to the EU? Perhaps a strategic a rival. Uh, not at all. Okay. D despite the fact that the no European nation has been included in any 
flood-related affairs in the East Pacific? That's not a problem for us. We are big enough. We don't need to be part of uh, groupings like this. We are delighted that the U.S. and India and Japan and uh, and Australia uh, find such a high degree of commonality, despite the fact that India has not mentioned any critical words so far, in at least its voting with regard to Russia. Uh, we have very good relations bilaterally with India, but this is an issue where, which we have between us, as I know the US also has. We have excellent relations with Japan. We just had a summit two weeks ago with uh, new Prime Minister Kishida. It's the highest level of relations you can possibly have with a partner, which we have with Japan, uh, with a full-fledged economic partnership agreement, including FTA, with a strategic partnership agreement, with a new digital partnership, with a new green partnership, with a mutual data adequacy finding, which allows free flow of data between us. So it is the most highly developed relationship we have with Japan. We don't need to sit in the court to have good relations with Japan. And Australia, uh, after a significant hiccup over AUKUS, yeah. is um, on a positive uh, slope upwards, as it was also uh, before that event. Mm -hmm. So you don't feel any need that the EU also form a similar partnership with these countries? No. And would you say that the EU approach to the region then is aligned with the approach of the Quad? Uh, we have many similarities with certain uh, positions taken by the Quad and uh, would agree with many of the outcomes. And I see that the Quad wants now to work on a certain, very often, particularly the Chinese said the Quad mm -hmm. is the beginning of a NATO in, um, in uh, East Asia or so, yeah. but. Every Quad member has said it is not. Um, they have certainly have a high level of political uh, cooperation, uh, but uh, they now want to cooperate on some very concrete issues uh, linked to climate change, linked to uh, vaccination, um, and, and uh, also, I think, in the digital sphere. So if then the Quad would invite some other partners to work yeah. on this, I think that's... Um, an interesting development and may allow us also to work in these fields if we approach. But we are not raising our hand and can we please also be invited. Okay. Uh, we don't but if you were invited, you would accept the invitation? Then we will carefully consider whether it's in our interest. All right. Um, so both China and the Quad, uh, although you seem to have some disagreement here, they are better um, no, no, I want to be clear. Pacific, we do right? not have a strategic rivalry nor a yes. systemic rivalry with partners with whom ha we have extremely close relations and who are like-minded right. democracies. Is the EU then perhaps competing on infrastructure investment with the Quad, despite the level of high levels of cooperation between the EU and Quad countries? The uh, European companies are competitors around the world with many other uh, but uh, we have a connectivity partnership with Japan. We have a connectivity partnership with yes. uh, India. And so we work with these partners. We have similar aims and uh, we work on the basis of common um, principles for connectivity, which were fixed first in the G20 context and then in more detail in G7 context. And you are likely to see soon coming out from the G7 um, a uh, special partnership on this. Uh, so. You see there are various um, groupings, international groupings. Uh, the key is whether on substance you agree, it is not so much the key whether in the format you right. come always together in the same groupings. Okay. So we'll now take the time to have some audience questions perhaps. If anyone wants to raise their hand and ask a question. I have one all the way in the back. Someone can help. I was wondering if you have any insights in regard to the Taiwan-China conflict and uh, what role, if any, Europe has in that conflict and whether or not that uh, <coughs> strategy has been in any way influenced by the Russia-Ukraine conflict that's been going on. Yeah, thank you for this uh, very pertinent question. I think that the Chinese leadership studies extremely carefully every single step which is taken. 
by the US, by the European Union, and our partners in the Pacific in this regard, because the decisions which have been taken are unprecedented in their economic and financial impact. Russia has invaded a neighboring state disregarding, not for the first time, because we had in 2014 the Crimea annexation, disregarding the guarantees itself has given in, two, in uh, 1994 in the Budapest Memorandum as regards territorial integrity of Ukraine, guaranteed by Russia, by US, by France, and by Britain, and China joined that guarantee because China has always said Article 2 of the UN Charter is for us key territorial integrity, inviolability of internationally recognized borders. No use of force for this. That is a situation where the state Russian Federation has invaded the state Ukraine. Now the Chinese would probably argue that Taiwan is part of China, which it is. One China policy. US has one China policy, EU has one China policy. No doubt about it. Having come from, coming from a country which has experienced its own reunification, which was a voluntary and a peaceful reunification. I'm not against China reunifying, I'm not against Korea reunifying. The key is voluntary, peaceful, based on mutual agreement. When President Biden and President Xi Jinping had a conversation about this, I think last year it was their first meeting, virtual meeting, then President Xi Jinping tried to reassure President Biden by saying, we still have patience. It should still be peaceful and voluntary. So what does it mean, it should still be peaceful and voluntary? I don't believe it's in the interest of China to create a major international crisis after the crisis we, have, we are currently living through, a major international destabilization. And you have heard what President Biden said in Japan about the US military uh, support to Taiwan. So what we Europeans do, we have a significant relationship with Taiwan, but not with the state of Taiwan, but with Taiwan. Uh, we have, um, we are the largest investor, foreign investor in Taiwan, and a steadily growing trade relationship. You will see some major Taiwanese investments very soon in Europe. And we talk about many other things than only economic and financial things, but we recognize Taiwan as part of China. And if there was a deterioration, we certainly will be asked to uh, support Taiwan. I hope it will not come to this. But I finish by saying that watch all carefully for the October Communist Party Congress in China, where President Xi Jinping will get a new mandate, his third mandate. The only Chinese leader who will get a third mandate after Mao Zedong and Deng Xiaoping. And I would uh, expect that the reunification of China, meaning Taiwan with mainland China, as part of the so-called rejuvenation of China, will be a critical, important part. But for this, as the German process showed, you have to win the hearts and minds of people, and you don't have to coerce people. But you don't have to coerce people, but if reunification is going to be a major agenda point for China after October, what do you think they're going to do? What can you the other thing I learned as a former uh, press spokesman <laughs> is never answer hypothetical questions. <laughs> Very good. Maybe we can uh, entertain more audience questions, if anyone has a question. Uh, you pick. Uh, you, with the glasses. And we'll both have the glasses. Yes. In, the, in the back. <laughs> yeah, so uh, in light of the uh, ramping up of investments, 
um, in less economically developed countries. Uh, where can we imagine that these capital gains then eventually flow and what efforts are being made to avoid falling into uh, um, neocolonialist patterns? Are you referring to um, connectivity related investments? Uh, all kinds of investments, uh, specifically FDIs, uh, infrastructure. Um, there are going to be capital gains, economic growth that come out of this. Uh, do they flow back to us or are they going to be reinvested in countries um, along those lines? Well, I think in the European Union we would definitely uh, reject any notion of uh, new colonialist practices. Uh, we have many. We have several member states who had a significant number of colonies. We lost one, which had the, probably the highest number of colonies. But um, this time is definitely behind us. We do not want to create dependencies. We want to uh, be partners in the economic development, in the diversification of economies in a sustainable way. I would like to add as a key principle for any of the uh, actions uh, with our partners. Uh, we will, um, this was re very clearly expressed recently at the EU African Union Summit. Uh, we have this um, new agreement uh, which is called the ACP Agreement, Africa, Caribbean, Pacific. These are all former colonies. This was created after the end of the colonization, decolonization process. We have for the first time now for Africa, for the Caribbean, for the Pacific, each one a specific pillar which responds to the special needs of each region. In the Pacific case, it's a lot linked to ocean governance, to overfishing, to um, uh, biodiversity, to climate change, to name a few. But also it adds a political level dialogue which is always difficult to do from one to one when you deal with Vanuatu or Kiribati or so, but as a, as a group, and which reflects the uh, different attitude towards the countries. So I don't want to sound uh, naive or romantic, but the tone of international relations, whether you deal with a very big country like the US or China, or whether you deal with a very small and distant country has significantly evolved since the 50s or the 60s. It is based on equality and is based on respect and certainly for Europe that is important that we are not bullying third countries. And our companies, I would say, are interested in, uh, in reliable uh, global value chains but not in uh, exploiting third countries and in devastating um, their environment for that purpose. Do we have a final question in the audience? You, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so you mentioned that it wasn't in China's interest to um, start a conflict in Taiwan now. Um, could you perhaps expand why, why not now? Uh, what, what the difference would be one year from now, five years from now? or any, any time in the, in, the, in the near future? Could you perhaps uh, expand on that and explain why, why that would be the case? Uh, I do not want you to misunderstand me as ha if I had implied that while it is not in the interest of China now, it may be in the interest of China in five years to take uh, uh, military action. Um, why do I use the word now? Because you can see what such a massive violation of international law, uh, what the military action vis-a-vis -vis a neighbor can lead to. And China has risen out of massive levels of poverty over the last 25 years getting 600 million people out of poverty. Why? Because that communist China has in a very determined way seized opportunities which liberalization and globalization brought. I'm quoting President Xi Jinping who said, the best beneficiary 
of globalization has been China because it allowed us to move to a very different stage of development. This is called interdependency. China would not be where it is now without the open markets, and without the technology from Europe or from the US. We have a mutual interest in maintaining this, and they would put this in danger if they would take military action and force unification. Right. And thank you to our audience. Um, so, we've discussed the, uh, China and the Indo-Pacific so far, um, and you've mentioned your experience working in Eastern Europe and um, with Russia. So, can you kind of concretely tell us how has the Ukraine war affected the relationship between the EU and China? given the fact that China has not taken a strong stance against Russia? We have had three votes at the United Nations. The three at the United Nations General Assembly. The first, we got 141 votes in favor of the European and let's call it Western position. Mm -hmm. The second, 140 votes. The third was about the... Um, suspension of Russia from the Human Rights Council, which got significantly less votes, but still a majority. China was never in agreement with any of these, but objected through abstention, as also several others have done. China is an awkward position, mm -hmm. because uh, it wants us to understand that it continues to be fully behind the UN Charter, and in particular that famous Article 2. It cannot walk away from its own rhetoric and principles, and we want to believe it, but it also cannot walk away from something which has just been agreed between the two presidents in a political declaration on the 4th of February. And perhaps China did not foresee, or perhaps China was not informed, by the Russian Federation about all the actions it was planning. We have so far preserved EU-China relations from a significant negative impact of the situation in Russia. We had probably more hoped that China would use more of its influence yeah. on the Russian Federation, notably when it comes to ceasefire, notably when it comes to creation of humanitarian corridors. But perhaps related to but that. But they are, and I just finish with this, yeah. uh, they have, and I've said this, I'm sorry, I repeat myself, they have heard clearly from us, mm -hmm. from others, mm -hmm. that if there was sanctions circumvention, if there was support mm -hmm. of the war effort, it would have a direct impact on the quality of eu china relations. We are not there. But to relate this back perhaps to the EEAS and your work, you met with China in April and perhaps you couldn't convince them to take that stronger stance in terms of condemnation. Are we to understand that, are we perhaps to accept that the Euro European diplomacy's power is perhaps declining? No, it's actually steadily growing. Okay, how so? And this I say not as a former spokesman because our weight was significantly lower at that time. I think many people in the world have been surprised that these 27 nations making up the European Union can act so fast mm -hmm. that we can impose so many sanctions of significant economic and financial impact, including the freezing of massive Russian central bank reserves and now also the energy ban, the sanctioning of so many key entities and personalities that we are cutting basically all major economic links with the Russian Federation, even though we have been massively dependent on the energy from that neighbor. The fact that we have accommodated in a matter of weeks five point two million Ukrainian refugees without leading to a ner nervous breakdown in our decision-making nor in our societies. On the contrary, that was a welcoming attitude in all, I underline, all member states. 
unfortunately, contrary to what, not unfortunate, but contrary to what has happened before with other waves of refugees. Exactly. That we have um, even had the political uh, courage to say the newly created European Peace Facility, which was there to provide non-lethal equipment to countries in conflict, would be used for the delivery of weapons to Ukraine, never seen, never heard. That Europe collectively would do this, perhaps the one or the other member state. No, Europe collectively does it. So perhaps this is the moment of the real maturing of EU foreign policy, which is the policy which was the least able to become integrated, contrary to so many other key policy areas in the economic and sectoral fields, contrary even to home and justice. And part of this kind of maturing seems to be a development of hard power. Um, that's what many of your bosses have said recently over the last few months. Is there a development of European hard power in the Asia Pacific? Thank you for this question. Yeah. Um, first, hard power. When it comes to hard power in Europe, defending our territory, it's mm -hmm. the business of NATO. Yeah. To be very clear about this, and uh, very interesting that one of the many unintended consequences of the Russian aggression against Ukraine is that now two long-standing non-allied members of the European Union, Finland and Sweden, uh, will join NATO. Um, as regards let me also say uh, that people should know that the European Union is not security averse, that we are active in many parts of the world. Few people know this. We have 18 missions abroad, 18, some 5,000 staff involved, mostly military but also civilian, in conflict areas, from Bosnia to Libya, from Somalia, and the uh, Horn of Africa to the Central African Republic, to name a few. Yeah. Now, on the Indo-Pacific, that is, of course, from our member states, the farthest away region, even though Europe has territories there. Few people know this. If there is any French student here, you will immediately recognize there are French territories. And because of these French territories, the European Union is the largest holder of exclusive economic zones in the world, mm -hmm. and in particular in that part of the world. We have a half a million citizens of Europe living there, and there are several military bases. And I could give you more figures if the UK would still be part of the European Union, because it also has all of this. So we are a present regional actor including a military presence. Now, what we have uh, started to do is, well, first we have a permanent military mission, the so-called IONAF for mm -hmm. Atalanta, which is in front of the Horn of Africa, acting against piracy. Uh, there are always two, three ships, and we are also interacting with Japanese and um, um, uh, Chinese, uh, Pakistani, Indian, different uh, marines, different navies. Uh, working against that same uh, uh, plague. Uh, there has been recently a decision of the Council when the so-called strategic compass was adopted, a new common strategic vision of where our secu key security interests are worldwide, where Indo-Pacific Asia has been mentioned for the first time ever in any EU security document. References to China, reference to ASEAN, references yeah. to Indian Ocean, Pacific Ocean, and the need to be present in particular uh, on cyber security issues, but also in terms of maritime security. And it was decided in February by the Council to establish a so called coordinated maritime presence in the Northwest Indian Ocean. That is quite revolutionary. We have one such coordinated maritime presence, coordinated between different naval assets of member states in the Gulf of Guinea, and we will now transport this approach, transport, transfer this approach also to the Northwest Indian Ocean. You have the Gulf, you have Pakistan, India, and then the entrance towards the Suez Canal. Lots of European trade goes through there, and there is uh, already a military mission in the Gulf from which we hopefully will benefit where there are assets of seven member states. 
So this is now to be uh, established. Apart from this, we have offered several states across the region uh, enhanced security cooperation by using experts from our armed forces and our uh, law enforcement services in the fields of counterterrorism, cyber security, peacekeeping, and as well maritime security, and work in particular with India, Japan, uh, and also with um, uh, Vietnam, Korea. And lastly, we have a program for coastal maritime awareness for coastal agencies with a good software, which is used in Europe, and which we are offering now to many partners from the Indian Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. So we are starting. Don't compare us to the US. Don't compare us to any nation state. But there are few, if any, regional organization which does as many things in the security field as we do. But let's just compare to the US and the Quad and China for a second, right? All of these developments are very recent. So is the EU lagging behind in the Asia Pacific when it comes to security? Well, the security uh, task, as I said at the outset, is first and foremost for NATO, for our territory. And secondly, we have security interests, which we will have to also underpin by more security action in the region. Yes, we are lagging behind, but we don't want to rival, neither with the Chinese nor with the U.S. presence. This would be um, um, uh, highly unrealistic. But you will see more Navy presence and other security presence in the region of Europe. But there seem to be increasing tensions in the region. Uh, we've seen in the last 15 years, China has worked to establish its military dominance. We see Vietnam and Indonesia both modernizing their militaries as we speak to perhaps defend themselves from Chinese aggression. How can we expect the EEAS to pacify this, such tensions? I think it's very important to realize indeed, as you say, that there are steadily increasing, increasing security tensions in this area. On the one side, it is the most economically dynamic area. It becomes more and more an area also of high innovation. And uh, the fact that many European students are also going now to this, from China mm -hmm. to other places, uh, is a good indication of this. Not just Chinese students coming here, and I see there may be some here in this uh, gathering, but also that Europeans go there, which is very good. But the military build-up is significant. The cyber security capacities mm -hmm. are, cyber insecurity capacities rather, are significantly built up. I would like to recall that the European Union has sanctions against certain uh, operators from China, from Russia, and from North Korea in place because of cyber attacks. Uh, we have to realize that the geo-economic competition is also a geopolitical and a geostrategic competition. And this is in the absence of a security architecture. So it is potentially very uh, dangerous. And uh, we see how Australia is uh, intensifying its cooperation with certain other partners precisely for all of these reasons. Um, so I think we're going to start to round off the conversation. Uh, but what can Europe learn from these upcoming regional powers? What can they learn from the countries in the South Pacific? Um, well, South Pacific, that's a very broad definition. I guess you want to include Australia and New Zealand. That's true. Yeah, as I, much as you, the Solomon you just brought Islands. them up, so I am curious as well. If they're you know, up when, I, when I went to Australia first time, I think in 2016, I was fascinated to listen to people who were telling me that the uh, rich Chinese people are placing their money in Australia, mm -hmm. similar to the Russian oligarchs in London and other parts of Western Europe. Uh, why? Because they don't have trust in their own system, they want to place it in safety somewhere else. That the same people, and that includes more and more of middle class people, are sending their children to study in yeah. Australia or New Zealand. I had not realized to which degree Australia is a safe haven for so many. But then I was struck when I heard that you had to pass a foreign interference law in Australia 
because there were so many Chinese influence agents who successfully had approached so many Australian politicians and parties. This would be impossible, we thought, in Europe. Uh, we knew, of course, about Russian influence agents in our open political systems. This is, I think, one of the other key challenges for your generation. We all want to have as open, as free, as liberal our societies as possible, providing as many opportunities in full openness to each individual. But that um, openness can be abused by those who are not representing open societies. And this manipulative disinformation or suppression of information approach should not change the character of our own societies. So our democracies must be not naive, our democracies must be combative in a competitive sense, but also in a security awareness sense. We cannot afford to do just Adam Smith approaches. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Vigan, for coming to Room for Discussion today. And also thank you so much for our audience for coming. Um, we will have at this interview, along with many other interviews, posted on our YouTube and on our Facebook page. Um, Make sure to check our Instagram and our Spotify. Next week, we have the honor of welcoming Sergio Jaramillo, a key negotiator in the 2016 peace deal between the government of Colombia and the FARC. See you next week. Thank you so much.